speak, and so I appreciate very much the sentiments, and I missed it too. I miss being here. It feels like home again, and so I look forward very much to um, this program on a weekly basis. Now, every Thursday morning, we have cabinet, and my cabinet colleagues would joke with me when I go to cabinet on, on Thursday morning because I, I'm, I tend to put a smile on my face and, and in spite of everything and all the work, um, I try to look happy while, while doing it. And it's about managing. And so they joke with me and they say, you know, it's, you can, you can the, the work or the strain of the work is not telling on you because you get a vent on your, on your program on Wednesday night. So that's, or at least that's what I told them, that I come here and I can get to relieve some of the frustrations because I can have an honest conversation um, with the people um, of our country and everyone everyone who's joining us, whether it's in Guyana or around the Caribbean, in North America. Um, I enjoy very much having frank conversations um, with you and, you know, I can say some things here and be blunt and brutally honest about the quality or lack thereof of the opposition that we have and the opposition members and members of parliament that we have. And I can be brutally honest here on this program and sometimes you have to you have to just call a spade a spade and i get an opportunity to release that on this program of course when i'm in parliament i have to choose parliamentary words when i am describing some of them um, but i'm pleased to to be here again this evening and I thank you very much for your, your kind comments over the past week, um, expressing how much you missed the program. And so I'm pleased to be back. Um, I did remember, I, I do remember where we left off two weeks ago, and we were having a very important conversation. And I started to show you a video that I had to cut short because I, I ran out of time, which is a normal thing on this program. Because in Guyana, there is always so much to talk about. There is always so much happening. And there is all, always so much misinformation that we have to continuously correct and ensure that people get the right information and that people understand exactly the circumstances of certain situations. And so it's very important that we keep this dialogue going. So I was in the middle of, of, and I'll try to keep an eye on the time tonight because I want to make sure I cover all of my topics this evening. So um, without further ado, I want to go into that video. So this, this is an exchange between His Excellency President Ali and one Leland Saul, who was a former uh, member of the government, the APNU AFC, from 2015 to 2020, and served as the CEO for Central Housing and Planning Authority. And you would recall, I put up on the screen a letter that he wrote um, to a United States representative. Um, under the, the signing for an organization called the Institute for Action Against Discrimination. This letter was written in November of this year, talking about Guyana being on the brink of civil unrest. And one month prior to the issuing of this letter or, or the, the writing of this letter, addressed to a United States representative. This was the same Leland Saul that signed this letter, speaking about Guyana being on the brink of civil unrest. Just one month prior to writing this letter, this is the exchange between the same Leland Saul and our president. Good day, sir, Leland Saul. Your Excellency and team, welcome to Belgium and more particularly El Dorado, the soul of West Berbice. We are pleased to have you here, but I understand why we were not informed 
I was thinking initially maybe it was some security concern. I don't have any security concern. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't have any security concern right. so anywhere in the island. Right. I can stop anytime, anywhere, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I want to nevertheless assure you that you're well secure here and have nothing to be worried about, right? Um, you know, ideally we would have wanted to, especially community leaders would have wanted to uh, consult with their constituents so that problems that we raise are common and we do not bug you down with trivial issues. Some time ago, this community, this NDC, we sat down and we began to work on a community development plan, which is very holistic. One of the things that we did initially was um, a land use plan. And coming out of that, we want to come up with this development plan that take into consideration the SDG and the low carbon development strategy and so on, as we move the community forward as we address economic and social issues. We will continue to work on that plan and the NDC will champion that plan. Is there any priority or you want us to address now? Yes, agriculture, our back dam. We want people to go back there and farm. We need that back dam to be clear, especially from falls going straight through to wetland. That is important. False the weather, the back, the backlands. How many acres of land is that? Um, I know El Dorado gets about ninety of oh, hundred. It will be maybe over six hundred acres of land that can be put into cultivation for uh, vegetables and fruits. What is the condition of the land now? Coconut it's very bushy. Coconut trees. Coconut trees, fruit trees, and very very bushy. And who owns the land? There are held by proprietors within the village, individual proprietors, but we did have a discussion, myself and uh, Mr. Ruplau, some time ago, to address the issue. So can we get, uh, so can we organize a meeting with the Minister of Agriculture, the proprietors, and Zania. Let's arrange a meeting with them because we have to get them on board too, right? Okay, sir. And also the community, because if we invest in cleaning the land and so on, we must have the community also benefiting. And not that when we clean the land, the proprietors decide to go and rent it out to die sums to people. So let's also work in a holistic way. So let's get the proprietors together, the community together, and uh, and the Minister of Agriculture will meet with you at, at the Ministry on Monday. Tuesday. At Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Okay, sir. All right? Thank you. Good. And sir, then we'll work on that. Sir, there's a next next issue. I know I would have written you about three weeks ago and I am confident that you would have um, passed that letter to the relevant agency. So but some lands at the back here where MMA would have dug two canals. The point is we it resulted in the loss of twenty something acres of land. And we need that issue to be addressed. We are not asking for a financial compensation. We need alternative land. So these were land privately owned? Yes, sir. It's, uh, they are free old land. In these villages, all the lands are private. So you all talk to the people? This was land to be before 2010. Okay. So, all right. So we'll raise that issue with the Minister of Agriculture on Tuesday also. Okay, okay sir. Thank you. Those are my... Right. So... I wanted to play the clip in its entirety to make this point. Leland Saul is a man who described to this Congress woman that Guyana is, or is telling this, this Congress woman, Guyana is on the, he says, actually let me quote him, to say that Guyana is on the brink of civil unrest is mildly describing the situation. That's what this gentleman wrote about our country or the state of our country, in his view, because I don't know of anybody else who will hold this view, but in his, this is his view, and he's expressing this.
to a member of the United States Congress. And I took the time to show you that video. You listen to Saul describing a situation. This is in Belladrum, by the way. That interaction took place in Belladrum. Uh, APNU stronghold, or so they may think, because things are changing. And I don't think APNU has any stronghold, any part of this country anymore. But for argument's sake, an APNU stronghold, the president is there in person and sitting on the tent, listening to people, gave Leland Saul the microphone and gave him a platform to air his concerns, his grievances, to listen to his recommendations. And look at our president, sitting there very humbly, finding out, asking probing questions. He's listening very carefully to Saul and asking probing questions. How much land is there? What is the condition of the land? So that he can make a decision. He's asking these questions because he's trying to come up with a solution to the issue that Leland Saul is raising. And then the president went further. He committed to sending back his Minister of Agriculture, sending back the minister, Minister Mustafa, to have a follow-up meeting, which did take place, to have a follow-up meeting with Saul, Leland Saul, and the representatives of um, the, the community that are the, um, interested in the same agricultural land that um, Leland Saul is, is speaking about. Does that look, does that exchange, or would that exchange happen in a country that is on the brink of civil unrest? You know, sometimes I think we have it too good here in Guyana, you know, like we, we, we start to invent problems. And this is what the opposition has to do in any case, because they don't have solutions to anything. They never had a vision. They have a failed track record in and out of government. They, they do nothing constructive, they do no work. They, so they have to invent scenarios, they have to inv invent situations and create problems in communities and nitpick and try to sow seeds of hate, try to turn everything into a, a, a racist problem or, 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 or issues of racism. They raise all kinds of extremities and talk about discrimination and marginalization of Afro-Guyanese. I don't know how you can be so disingenuous where one month before, this same, this same man, Leland Saul, is having a pleasant exchange, a productive exchange with the president who is within his community, present in his community listening to not only Leland Saul, but all the people who were there, listening to them so that the president can make decisions on how he can develop the community, how he can resolve any of the, the matters that are affecting them, how he can improve their lives. And then he has the audacity, Leland Saul has the audacity to describe our country as being on the brink of civil unrest. These people are unbelievable. It's unreal. And that's why I took the time to, to just take you through the exchange and to show you what, how barefaced this gentleman is. And then at, a, at, a, at the follow-up meeting with Minister Zulfi Mustafa, he is seen in a photograph receiving equipment from the Ministry of Agriculture during a handover, a handing over ceremony. So the, these, these people are unbelievable. They have no shame. Leland Saul, all the, the members of parliament, all the members of the opposition from, from the leader right down 
all of them have no shame. Nothing embarrasses them. And, and they, 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 they keep doing the same things over and over. So then we have another similar situation that actually we have a lot of similar situations because it's a pattern. It's a pattern that these, these people have now. They, they turn on the cameras and they run on Facebook and they scream and yell and cry and gripe about discrimination and, and, and marginalization of, the, of, the, of Afro-Guyanese and the PPPs are racist government. And, and yet, you see evidence to the contrary. It's before your very eyes, the reality of the president and all of his ministers being on the ground, there is evidence, evidence to support our work in different communities. Communities of, uh, made up of people of Indo descent, communities made up of people of African descent, mixed uh, communities in our Amerindian communities, you see us all the time, reaching out across this country, going into every community, in every region. No community is too large, no community is too small. Our president leading the way himself, as he committed to do in his first address, I remember very vividly, and that was, I felt like that was one of my first instructions as a minister, listening to the president say, we are going to walk with you on the ground in the same way that we did in opposition. We will be with you in your communities and I will lead this effort myself. Those were the words of the president when he, in his inaugural address to the parliament. He made that commitment and from that time to now, he has been fulfilling that commitment every single day. So that was, I felt that was my first in instruction. And then he issued a similar instruction when he met with his cabinet. And he said, we are going to build a one Guyana. And then he went on to describe for us what one Guyana means and what he would like to see us create beginning now in his first term in office, something that he, would, he, he wants us to achieve. It's about uniting our country, but it goes far beyond that. It goes far beyond uniting our country um, and uniting our ethnicities. It goes far beyond that. It is about ensuring development comes to the life of every single Guyanese. It's about ensuring the resources of our country is distributed equitably to every single Guyanese. It is about ensuring there is equal opportunity. It is about ensuring that every man, woman, and child receives education and training and skills development so that they can stand on their own two feet, so that they can provide for their families, so that people can work, so that people can earn, and so that we can build a country that all of us, Afro-Guyanese, Indo-Guyanese, mixed people, Amerindian people, Portuguese people, Chinese people, all of us can coexist and all of us can prosper together. That is the mandate that we have been given and that is what we have been trying to do and have been successfully doing. And you know what? It hurts. It hurts the opposition because not only do we have the experience in government, but people see clearly we are capable, competent, committed, and they see that every single day in the delivery of our commitments, not only of our manifesto commitments, but when we go out there and we reach the people and people express to us that they have issues that are affecting them, whatever the issues are, no matter how small they are, none are insignificant. When they express to us what their challenges are, 
we find a way to fix it. And we find a way to fix it quickly or as quickly as possible so that we can bring relief to the people of our country. And this, this track record, track record that we built prior to 2015 and the track record that we are building upon now is untouchable and incomparable to anything that the AP and UAFC has to offer. So that's why it hurts them. So they have to, they can't criticize us on policy. They can't criticize us on our track record. They can't criticize us on the delivery of our commitments. They can't open the manifesto, the PPP manifesto, like I often do here on this program, when I open their manifesto or the book of lies and go through it, they can't open the PPP manifesto and open it and say, oh, the PPP said they would do X, Y, and Z, but they're doing A, B, and C. Or they didn't do this, or they didn't do that, or they lied to you. They can't do that. And they can't challenge us intellectually in the parliament either. So they gotta just go and make up things. They all of them are delusional. Sometimes I think they actually believe the things that they say. Because I don't know how barefaced one can be. You, you have to probably believe your own lies. Which is very dangerous because we're going to have a bunch of people walking around in the opposition that are mentally affected by their own lies. They may start to believe their own lies. You know, when they repeat one thing over and over again, you probably start to internalize it and you start to believe that it's actually true. And you know, you may lose some mental capacity. And so we're gonna have a serious problem because everybody in the opposition will go mad if they continue along this path that they're going. Because in addition to that, imagine trying to convince people of a situation that doesn't exist and you lose in your audience. Every day they're losing people, they're hemorrhaging. People are coming over to our party. We go into communities and people are saying, not patronizing things to the PPP, but saying what the reality of the situation is. That the president is working. That the government is working. That the, that the, 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 the PPPC administration is delivering on its commitments. That's just a fact. You don't have to be PPP to say that. All you have to do is be able to open your eyes, watch the news, follow what's happening on social media, and you too will come to that same conclusion. And you too will know that this situation as described by the Leland Sauls and the Rickford Burks and the Norton and the Valdo and the Cathy Hughes and Camera Drums, all of them. You will know that the situation that they are describing is not the reality of the situation. So then you have another member of parliament. I call her the uh, cutlass wielding parliamentarian, Nima Flubes, because and there's stories about her running people in Mokko with the cutlass and, and all these things. So she's the cutlass wielding parliamentarian, Nima Flubes, who described some members in her community, put up a post on her Facebook page and described them as dunce thugs, simply because I think they had some good things to say about the PPP. But they're expressing their view that the government is working, that the government is fair, that the policies of the government are fair. And so she's offended by that. And then she went further. Well, she removed the post from her Facebook page, which should tell us that she knows it's an, it's an admission that what she said was wrong and offensive to the people of Mocha. 
And so the, those persons organized a protest against her. But instead of doing the decent thing and apologizing to the people of her community, a community that she claims to love and she says she defends and she's been defending because she's a resident of that community. Instead of doing the decent thing and apologizing to the people, she goes on a press conference um, yesterday, I think it was, and defended her comments and sat there on a panel of other members of parliament, including Ganesh Maipal and Royce Dale Ford and some others, and so and defended her comments. But this name of, what's her name, Flu Bess, is a thug. She is the real thug. And she's saying, she started off her statement, imagine the second line of the statement. She says this, I cannot help people to read and comprehend if they don't understand something. That's how she opens her statement. You imagine sitting on a panel. You are a member of parliament for the opposition. This is how you start off. Mind you, Nemo Flubes is a teacher by profession. A teacher. I don't, if, if I had a child and the teacher is Nima Flu Bess, right away I would, I would withdraw my child um, from Nima. I wouldn't want her as, as, as a teacher for my child because she's clearly making an admission here that she can't help people to read, she can't help people to teach, she, she can't teach people, and she, she can't help people who can't comprehend. But she's a teacher by profession. I don't know the Ministry of Education or somebody better look into this because she's, ad she's admitting here that she can't teach. So if I, if I had a child in, 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 in her class, I would need her removed as a teacher, especially for her offensive comments about dunce thugs in the, in the community. I, mean, I could tell you which one of them is dunce, but um, and that's that's Nima, but anyway. Um, so she, she, and then recent, why she's, why I call her a thug, more recently, she also confronted a cameraman who was covering an uh, APNU meeting that they had in Moko. Now, on one, you don't know how to please these people. If the media didn't go, you would hear PPP controlling the media and um, they didn't get no coverage. And nobody from the Chronicle came and nobody from DPI came and they didn't get any coverage and the PPP is controlling the state media. That's what you would have heard. Now the cameraman is there minding his business, doing his work, covering the event, and Nima flew best, chased the man out, won't take away his camera. This kind of thuggish behavior, this is, how, this is how these people operate. Ask the people of Mokka, they'll tell you she's run people in, in, in the community there with cutlass and all, and all kinds of things. This is the kind of people, this is the caliber of the people that the APNU chose to put in the parliament. So what do you think will happen in the parliament? Not the same? <laughs> Is the same thing will happen in the parliament when you had the whole situation with the mace and the, and the, the, uh, what the AG said, the dancing and the gyrating and the blowing of the whistles. Is the same thing you will have, have in the parliament? Because this is the nature of the people that we're dealing with. The people not serious. <laughs> These people are, are not serious. So, and then they have another thing that they do when, when afro Guyanese speak well about the government, they berate them. And they, they, they belittle them. They call them all kinds of names. And that's how this Don Stug comment came up. She's referring to, to Afro-Guyanese within her community. This is the label 
that she's putting on them. And some others have used worse words than this. But this is the, the pattern that I'm, that I'm referring to because it, it, it cuts deeply when they see afro Guyanese just speaking the truth. They're not PPP. They're just being honest. And they're giving you their honest assessment of what is happening in the country. Every day you see videos surfacing on social media, on TikTok, um, in the newspapers, people coming up and speaking to, to the media and giving their comments about the work that the government is doing. So they are, they are completely out of options. They have nothing to offer their constituency except go to the parliament and want to rock up the parliament. And when they have to debate a bill, like the, the important pieces of legislation that were recently passed in our National Assembly, I spoke about some of them at length on this program. And then after that, which we, the pieces of legislation like the, the, um, the legislation to remove custodial sentence for smaller possession of small amounts of marijuana, like placing responsibility on, on bar owners and so on, not to serve people who are visibly intoxicated, the restorative justice bill. These are transformative pieces of legislation that we did not have on the law books before. And this is all in keeping with um, moving Guyana into a modern society, updating our legislation, um, passing new and modern legislation, ensuring that we have s stiffer fines and, and penalties for certain offenses. And then we have the higher purchase bill that was passed last week as well, which gives, which gives um, greater protection to consumers so that we don't have situations that we had before with um, companies or, or people who enter into higher purchase agreements, the companies coming to repossess your items after you have paid a significant amount of money. We have changed the law to say if you have paid 70%, at least 70% of the purchase price, then the, the company or the, or the seller cannot come to repossess that item, thereby giving greater protection to consumers so that they do not lose all of their installments that they would have paid previously. If they miss a payment, they have time in which to make up for that payment so they can rectify the situation. And so if you bought a car, for example, we know that I know of several instances where people bought vehicles on, on higher purchase and missed a payment, were making their payments all the time, missed one payment, parked their vehicle somewhere, gone into a store or, or, or somewhere or gone to bed at night and wake up next morning and the vehicle is gone because the, the auto sale, the auto dealer came and just removed the vehicle and repossessed the car because you missed a payment. So that can no longer happen. We passed legislation, a completely new higher purchase act to protect people against things like that. And the usual thing from the, the opposition benches, they, they stood up and they had a whole set of um, recommendations on the higher purchase bill, including the man who was the last minister of business before they, they eventually were kicked out of office in in 2020. Um, what's his name again? Him, him, Ram Raj, Raj Kumar? Yeah. Um, so he stood up and he got a whole lot of recommendations now all of a sudden. But they had five years in government, did nothing, even though President Ali had this bill on his agenda when he was the minister, former minister of tourism, industry, and commerce. This bill was supposed to pass since then. They came into government shortly after did nothing for five years, which is in keeping with their track record of zero. And, and then all of a sudden, 
the bright light bulb now they 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 have all kinds of suggestions to make and when they're not making stupid suggestions because if you listen to the suggestions they don't make any sense about capping interest rates and all of these things that are not in keeping with the open and free society open and free market um, economy so when they don't have any suggestions they just abandon the parliament which is what they did on Monday so they, they came to parliament and ask questions for eight hours on the supplementary financial paper that we we took to parliament they had eight hours they took from 10 in the morning to 6 in the evening had they could ask stand up and ask as many questions and as they want and ask whatever questions they wish and then they're going to still run and say that the PPP is not transparent, they're not accountable to the people, and all of this, and all of these things. And then by the time we got to debating the representation of the People's Act and the National Registration Act, they abandoned the parliament. Maybe one or two of them spoke, had nothing to say on the bill, spoke about all kinds of other things in keeping um, with their pattern, and then just completely abandon the parliament but we'll come a little bit later to the um to the representation of the people's act and some of the amendments that we made in that act but coming back a little bit to this pattern that they have of attacking afro guyanese for speaking their truth not for representing the ppp but for speaking their truth every time you see somebody on social media just say that we got our house lot, for example, or we got our title after so many years or after we didn't get anything before. That is an issue. That is a problem for them. And if you check the comments on the, on the social media or you check their Facebook page, they're putting up people's photos and calling them all kinds of names, attacking people of African descent just for speaking their truth and, and, and speaking the, the reality of the situation. So we have, in the same um, Mocha community, we have an ongoing matter there where we are building the four-lane highway in the second phase moving from Eccles to Diamond. And a portion of that road is passing through Mocha, where you have some squatters that are directly in the road alignment. But they continue to tell people lies. They continue to dissuade people from negotiating and, and engaging the Ministry of Housing, even though we have been engaging them since August of 2021 because we, we knew the alignment and we knew there were squatters along that alignment in the mock-up portion. And we've been engaging them. And so far we have moved, I believe it's 32, 32 or 33 um, families who were there already. And we have since relocated them. Those, those persons are no longer squatters. We have made them into landowners and homeowners. We've put them into communities that have access to electricity, have access to water. They are now absorbed into a community, into a neighborhood where they are living in dignity and with respect. And they have homes of their own and they were compensated for their lands even though they were squatting. They started off by squatting, but they have been there for decades. And so we recognize um, their rights there, and we sought to transform their lives. And at the same time, continue with the infrastructure development that is needed for us to finish that road. And that road passing through that community, we didn't bypass that community. We didn't circumvent 
and Afro Guyanese community because we want them we want to marginalize them. We took the road straight through, which will see tremendous development coming to that community, opening up that community, not landlocking it, but opening it up to opportunities and, and new people who, who may move into that community, opening it up for businesses who will want to come into that community so that the community can thrive and so that the development in that community will match the development that is happening in various communities across our country. But Nima Flubis and the, the, who, by the way, she acts as the, she behaves as though she's the governor for Mokko. So everything other pass through Nima, we, every, the government must go and consult Nima because I don't know who Nima is. We go and we talk to the people of Mokko. We go and we talk to the people whose lives are being affected and whose lives we will now transform. So I don't know who Nima really thinks she is, Governor Nima. That everything must come true. She, I don't know who made her the, represent, the representative of the people. If you really want to represent the people, you will try to persuade them that this is the best thing that can ever happen to them. Because they're not, they're not living as squatters. They're not living with illegal connections to electricity and water. They're going into established communities where they can raise a family and live in dignity and have a, 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 their quality of life and their standard of living improved. But she don't want that for them. Because Governor Nima doesn't care about the people of Mokko. She claims to care about the people of Mokko, but she wants to dissuade them from engaging with the government so that they can see, so that they will be prevented from seeing what real transformation is. But you know what? Out of 35, we have 33 or 32 that can see that this is an opportunity of a lifetime for them. And they have accepted. Many of them have moved into their new homes, have settled in. We still have three holdouts, and they're keeping back the development for that road. But you know that the PPPC government is a compassionate one, and we believe in dialogue. You don't go and bully people, bulldoze people. We, we believe in dialogue because we believe in the work that we are doing, and we believe that people that if people understand our vision and if people understand the objective of the work that we are doing, that they will understand. Because we don't believe that people are dunce dogs. We believe that people can read and comprehend and listen and understand. But Nima Flubes and the people in the opposition think that Guyanese are deaf, dumb, blind, stupid, that we couldn't see them openly rigging the elections, you know? They operate like, they don't want you to talk about when you're in any parliament and you start talking about 2020, they, they're allergic to it, they're going to spasm or, or, or something. They want to blank out that period from their, from their mind and they want Guyanese to forget. So they want you to blank it out too. They just gloss over that period, you know, like it never happened before. So, and they come and they talk about democracy. Imagine those people speaking about democracy. Something should, like they should get an electrical shock or something when they mention democracy. You know, they should, should get a shock to be, because they, how, how do these people say these things? And watch you in the face, these people are shameless. They're absolutely a shameless bunch of people. And then run around the place and, and, and claiming that they, they, they have Afro-Guyanese best interests at heart when their actions clearly demonstrates differently and demonstrates the opposite. And we have, and you can see this example of what's happening in Mocha replicated across the country. You saw the, I, I spoke at length about what took place in um, Belladrum with Minister Parag. Then more recently we had a standoff in Denamstel when Minister Indar 
was there to do some community upgrades. And they're, they're locking up the gate, have the, the NDC chairman locking up the gate and putting out the, the contractor, and putting out the excavator operator. We don't want development here. That's what's going on in the NDCs that are controlled by the APNU. But you know what? Local government elections is coming. And that's what they don't want. They are mortified of local government elections. They don't, they don't want that to happen because some of these same NDCs that they control now, they will lose control of them. And they don't want that. They're mortally afraid of the local government elections. When we were in opposition, and I said it before, we were happy to go to elections. <coughs> Any elections we're ready to go to because we are ready to prove that we have support and we are always very happy to put our, our plans out there to explain our vision and to let people know what our plans are for them. So we are always very happy to go to elections as opposition. But this opposition, it seems like they're comfortable <laughs> staying in opposition because they're not ready. They're not ready for opposition, much as ready for government. Because like I said, they're in opposition and they can't even represent the people properly. They came to parliament, asked a bunch of questions that, you know, waste time, waste eight hours, and then when we got to the substantive part of debating the bill, they disappear. Some fall asleep, some went home. And I don't understand how these people caucus for parliament, you know. They, we, parliament is a very, very, is a very, very serious situation, it's a very serious thing. Being in parliament, ensuring that we are present because we're there to do the people's work. And we take this very seriously. But they operate as though they could choose whether they should be in parliament or not. Like it's up to them. It's not up to you. People elected you to go sit in the parliament to represent them. And they have a constituency, people who voted for them. And those people deserve representation but they come when they feel like the opposition mem uh, the opposition leader was listed on the list of speakers to speak on one of the bills when we got to his name mr norton nowhere to be found he just pick up himself pick up his bag go home i don't know how they how they operate like that so that is um that is the record of the APNU, AFC, and the behavior of them within afro guyanese communities and trying to dissuade people from, I have to check the time because I, got, I already see like I'm gonna run out of time again. So that is their track record, that is their pattern of behavior and people have to recognize it afro guyanese guyanese in general have to recognize that these people do not mean well for uh, people of african descent they are the ones who are marginalizing afro guyanese because they don't want what is best for those communities they see the government is working they see the government is making inroads and it's hurting them deeply so they want to do everything that they can to prevent development from coming to communities. You cannot claim that you love a community and you love the people of a community and don't want what is best for them and trying to keep out development at all costs. It is wrong and people have to recognize that and people have to call them out when uh, people hear them speak about marginalization and discrimination when they know that that is not the case. 
So we have, um, we saw this week as well, a very historic, in the last few days, a very historic agreement being signed, and that is for the sale of carbon credits to Hess Corporation. Um, this is the first ever transaction globally for the sale of our trees credit, and this will see Guyana being paid 750 million US dollars for our carbon credit, meaning we will be paid 750 million US dollars for the preservation of our forests. Simply put, this, as you know, was a vision of our Vice President and our General Secretary, Dr. Bar Jagdio, who has been working on this for many, many years. And in 2009, I think it was when he signed the first agreement of this nature with Norway, with the Kingdom of Norway, and we saw Guyana being paid to preserve its forests. Then we saw the AP and UAFC go into government in 2015 to 2020, and in keeping with um, their way of not earning anything, because they don't, they don't know how to earn. They don't know how to govern, and they don't know how to earn money for the country. And this is our vice president ensuring that his vision be becomes a reality and that we continue and that Guyana continues receiving compensation for preserving its forests. And you know Guyana has um, the second large, largest forest cover in the world. And that amount of money that will be paid to Guyana is only 30% of the the carbon credits that are available for sale. So we still have 70% of our carbon credits that will be sold to another company or different companies. So this 750 million is just the beginning. And the Vice President announced that 15% of that, or $112 million, will go to Amerindian communities. And that is in keeping with a commitment we made in Guyana's low carbon development strategy, which will see 15% of money earned from the preservation of our forests going to Amerindian communities to enhance and improve the lives of our hinterland regions and our Amerindian brothers and sisters. Imagine we are also being paid, another feature of this agreement is we're being paid for the period 2016 to 2020 in the form of legacy credits. So this is called legacy credits and we're being paid for four years of when APNU was in government. We are able to recuperate monies from that period which will go towards the development of our country now. Imagine a government that can sell something and earn money for a country that you and I can't see. We're being paid for the preservation of our, of our forests. We're being paid to continue to breathe, the, to help the, the, the planet breathe and to ensure that the air is clean. That is a visionary government. That is a government that knows how to earn. That is a government that will, will translate into putting money in your pocket. And you know, Bar Dio, Dr. Bar Dio has a, a, rep, a reputation of being the man that ensures that money is in people's pocket. And this is another manifestation of a visionary agreement, a historic agreement, or historic arrangement, which will see Guyana earning money outside of its traditional sectors, outside of agriculture, outside of tourism, outside of oil and gas, earning additional revenues so that we can see our country 
develop on a scale and at a magnitude unheard of. And not only so that we can benefit nationally here, but the world is now looking on. The world is now looking at Guyana and saying, who is this Guyana? What is this Guyana that can sign an agreement like this, that can have its carbon credits approved for sale and, co and a company coming here to sign an agreement to pay us for our carbon credits dating back from 2016. People around the world are looking on, governments around the world, leaders around the world are looking on, looking at Guyana in amazement and wondering why didn't we think of this? Why can't we have a similar agreement? Granted, not everybody has natural resources and, and land and, and the amount of forests that we have. 86% of our, of our country is, is covered in forests. 85 or 86% of our country is covered in forests. And now we will be paid to maintain that forest um, while still ensuring uh, adding to, to our um, portfolio of being net zero and ensuring that we are committed to the environment, that we are committed to reducing emissions, and that we are committed to the Paris Accord um, and ensuring that we protect our forests. So, I did plan to go into the amendments in the Representation of the People's Act, but about five minutes ago I was signaled that I have five minutes remaining. So I'm going to have to wrap up now, but I will go through that with you next week. I did um, go through it before, but this was while we were still in the consultation phase, and, and I was explaining to you here about some of the the um, amendments that will be made so that we can see um, elections being held in a more orderly way, bringing more transparency and accountability to the process, ensuring that, they are, that the officers of GCOM are held accountable through stiff penalties if they try to, to rig an election or if they try to do anything outside of what the law stipulates when it comes to elections. Now those proposals are law because the Representation of the People's Amendment Act has been passed. So now it is the amendments that we were proposing are now part of our law. So um, I, I do think it's important that we have that conversation again. And so I'm going to take time to do that next week when I, when I return and I have more time to go through them in detail with you so that you are kept abreast with everything that is happening. And of course, I will be sure to tell you what the contribution of the AP and UAFC parliamentarians were during this debate process, and it will shock you at the, the, some of the recommendations that they were making and some of the, the matters or the points that they raised. It, it will leave you flabbergasted. So I want to thank you very much for joining me this evening. Um, it's not too late to share the program. Please, I didn't um, re remember to ask you to please share the, the live. There is still time to do that. Please share this so that other people who, are, um, who have missed the opportunity to, to watch tonight can join me later on. So please help me in, in spreading the word and sharing the program. It was a pleasure being here with you this evening. I look forward very much to our interaction next week. Please stay safe um, until we meet again next week. God bless you.